Hello. Hi. 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 Nice to meet you guys. Me too. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Oh, Daniel, you got that whole professional setup going on. Yeah. Shade, you know, the microphone. I got to get that set up. Yeah. Yeah. I've been um, just looking at, um, you know, I'd say Gary Tan's a big influence. He he uh, has gotten really into it. And I was looking at some of his stuff. And uh, oh, yeah, there's cool. a bunch of other people out there, I feel like, that are really, really good. One of the co-founders of Soylent. Uh, he started up a YouTube channel. Really? Oh, it's amazing. The YouTube channel goes into the history of like Silicon Valley. It's so deep. Wow. There's a lot of people building up these interesting like personal brands and content. And it's so fun to hear it like straight from the mouths of people who have built things and and just like raw. What are their thoughts? I love it. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. Yeah, I think I mean, part of like Gary Tan's success. I mean, I, I'm talking for him, but I don't, you know, I know him, but, you know, I'm also not him, but I think he's... Uh really good at telling stories and are articulating yeah. like i don't know the stories of just like silicon valley so he i think he amassed like a huge following just from just doing that and spending so much time like thinking about it but it also like gave him an advantage to like investing i think also which is really great mm -hmm. you know so he gets really good <laughs> i'd say opportunities honestly as an investor but yeah yeah totally i'm studying a lot about building i'm building kind of a personal brand post exit now because i was like I don't want to start a company again. I'm not there, but like, what's the light version of that? And it's like, well, I always loved speaking on behalf of like the movement that I think my company represented. And I'm like, I don't need to have VC investors and do the whole gamut of management in order to speak about something I'm passionate about. So I'm stoked you guys reached out. It'll be a fun conversation to talk about it today. Yeah, I think I, I might've reached out years ago. I just think you were in the thick of it. And this is years and years ago, maybe. I think, you know, that was when you were running your company. And I feel like you were just yeah. like working 24 seven nonstop and like stressed out and building something significant, <laughs> Yeah. you know? So like every, every minute of the day counted for you. I sensed it. I was like, she is, Tracy is really in it <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Well, now you've caught, I live in Honolulu now. Like I went surfing this morning. You've caught me at a very different phase. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So you're like, I guess you, that's like a complete 360 of like yeah. what you were doing. Like you were in Silicon Valley, in yeah. San Francisco originally doing a startup, had VC <laughs> investors. Now you're, yeah. I mean, you can still do that remote now. Yeah. You wouldn't want to sure. do something like that again or? Oh man, I, I never say never. I think that right now it is not my calling. I actually went through 18 months of terrible long COVID that I'm okay. just coming out of. It was so bad. There were periods where I just, I couldn't get out of bed. Like the, the fatigue I had tonight, I still have the tinnitus, dizziness. Like I had a lot of just, I just had a lot of really core issues that I, I'm convinced was, is the result of stacked up layers of just the stress and the trauma and the work over those 10 years. Plus some like personal stress, like relationship stress afterwards. And so I, I'm i only just coming out of it. So we'll see when I have like my, my energy levels back, you know, I might consider it, but I would do it in a totally different way. Oh, really? Like yeah. I, building, a, you mean by building a company, if you were to do it again? I would. I think the way that I work would be so different because I was so obsessed with hustle culture and oh, kind really? of that way of, yeah, working all the time feeling like I was under the work and the work was on top of me. And I've, I've come to realize now that I coach founders, I've come to realize that that method is, it's, it's, there's so much strain involved, but it's not, it's very tactical. It's not very strategic and it's not very smart at the end of the day. And, uh, and it's also terrible for your nervous system. It keeps you stuck in fight or flight. And when you're stuck in survival mode, you can't learn that much new. You can't think on top of the problem. You're just constantly swimming in the problem. So I think I would be much more boundaried about the way that I work within a company. And I'd probably also be a lot more myself from the beginning of it. It took me time. We could talk about that. But like I morphed into being, you know, kind of representing the culture of my company, which ended up being a love culture. But it, I was very scared to do it. It took me years to get there to like be my weird self and be the weird CEO that I was. I thought I'd just introduce myself. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm again. I'm friends with Dan. We've we've been doing this podcast for seven years or so, and we we love to uh, interview entrepreneurs and investors and sort of creative geniuses, visionaries. And so we're we're I'm very grateful for you speaking with us. I'm wondering if you could uh, walk us through your journey, co-founding and leading Choosy to becoming an executive coach, and like what was the 
catalysts mm. for this transition. So it's pronounced choose, by the way. This is a common common mistake. So the transition for me was by the end of the company, towards like selling the company, which was like an emotional kind of slog. And then when I finally, when I did sell the company and I came out of it, I did some reflection on what energized me the most. And I realized that there were two really, really bright spots in my day to day as the CEO. And one was coaching my executive team. I loved seeing their development. I loved helping them through their issues, um, not solving their problems for them, but training them on the skill set so that they could solve their own problems. And the second thing I loved was mentoring entrepreneurs. I, I always had, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, maybe a couple of those slots a week that I would give to entrepreneurs that were rising that had, didn't know what to do. And I always let those meetings energized. So when I left my company, I thought, what left me energized that I would want to take on as my next career trajectory? And it was those things. And I think that is what ultimately led me to being an executive coach. And it's just how do I help people grow? And I think I've always been sort of a, a helper at heart and in service. I saw that as a CEO, that was like my mission there. Now I find that the one-to-one -one is very much where my service is oriented towards. And so when I sold the company, I ended up moving to Hawaii. I thought I was gonna ride out, that was the pandemic when I sold my company. So I said, oh, I'll just spend like six months in Hawaii. You know, I'll ride it out. That's when we thought it was gonna be like a three month pandemic. And uh, a year later, I thought I'm in denial. And I finally swapped out my residency where I'm, you know, I'm now a Hawaii resident and I made this place my home and I made executive coaching my, you know, my current path. I don't know if it's my large mission. I don't know if it's what I'll do forever, but that's when I made that decision too. Yeah, Hawaii was a good choice. It was really safe for a while there, um, but I think the virus eventually came, right? And you've written about um, experiencing depression and burnout, imposter syndrome during your time, uh, excuse me, choosy? <laughs> choose. Choose. <laughs> choose. <laughs> choose. Uh, what's the origin of that name, choose? Because my mom is Chinese and my father is Russian Jewish. And so uh -huh. my friends called me Jewish when I was growing up. Oh, like Jewish plus Chinese. Oh, I get it. And then I started a food company and there was like chewing and then you had to like choose the provider you wanted to work with. So it just became choose. Cool. And then how, how did those challenges influence your, your leadership and, and personal growth? Yeah, I mean, I think the my own cycles of sort of depression and anxiety were often linked to fundraising. I think in a way, actually, they were the I had post-traumatic growth. We all talk about post-traumatic stress. But I think all of that stress made me the leader that I became. So one story in particular, um, when I was raising, this was my second round. So we'd raised a million already. And I was going out to raise kind of a seed extension, a $700,000 round. It took me 11 months, about nine months into it. And I'm sitting alone in my studio in Hayes Valley in San Francisco. And I'm getting rejection after rejection. And we finally get really far with this one VC who I, was, who I was really excited about. And he was coming out to meet the team that day. And he calls me that morning. And he says, you know, I've spoken to your customers and they say that this is one of the best services that they use at work. And your restaurants love the business that you bring them and find a huge value proposition with what you're doing. But unfortunately, we've looked at the market we think this is going to be a tough one that requires hand-to-hand -hand combat and we don't think you're out for blood and so we can't do this deal and i was very taken aback i remember hanging up and just sitting there and i had this terrible kind of panic attack anxiety spiral and i was like huh they never met my team what on earth would tell them that i'm not out for blood? i asked myself a lot of big questions that day one of the questions being what am i doing in silicon valley Right. If if I'm not out for blood, if I'm not here and I want to slit people's throats on the battlefield, right, which with the battleground metaphor it never worked for me. I am like too much of a lover and carer about people. I was like, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe this is the arena for gladiators and I'm not one. I remember about two days later, I kind of came out of it and I thought, you know what? He's actually right. I'm not out for blood. And I went back to the reason that I built the company. And I built the company out of a love, not just for food, but for community. And I really feel 
that it's so important for coworkers and people to be a community at work. And I thought, I built this business for love. And that's exactly the heart that I need to lean into. I need to stop shying away from that because I'm worried it's going to make me seem weak or emotional or too feminine or whatever. We came out of that and decided we're a love company. And it was a very big turning point for the culture. It was an inflection point for my leadership style. To this day, I'm so grateful. It was one of the best rejections I ever had because he taught me, you're right, I'm not out for blood and I don't wanna join that culture. It just does, it was too exhausting to try to fit that mold when that wasn't me and I was able to build a business in the direction of love and you know, build it to be tens of millions of dollars. What do you think he meant when he said out for blood? Cause like, I mean, entrepreneurs I've met haven't been like serial killers or anything like that. <laughs> what do you think he meant? <laughs> I think that there was a an element of like there's kind of like a masculine domineering energy of being out for blood like i want to crush the competition it's probably even a language thing right my language is not like that i definitely am competitive but i wasn't so like competition oriented i was very customer focused i think there was probably an element of that where he didn't see me like grinding my axe and just wanting to be out there and that angstiness so I think there may have been that. And he may have looked at my background. You know, I came out of college and built the company. And maybe he didn't see me with a sales background and didn't think. And it is it was a big sales motion. There were two sales motions, both on the restaurant, the supply side, as well as the offices that we sold to. And so maybe he looked and said, well, you're, you know, you don't have a sales background. I wish he would have been more specific in his feedback because the out for blood was just a really weird, vague piece of feedback I couldn't really act on. But nonetheless, it, it helped me grow. Yeah. I mean, I guess he meant, meant about like big enough market or something like to become a unicorn or it's hard to know what he meant. <laughs> but it's not like it had a big, big kind of turning point effect on you. But it, it caused you to look inside yourself and sort of discover your own inner strengths and decided to emphasize that instead of trying to meet someone else's expectations that are not aligning with your own mission and values. And that's what I mean by it took people not believing it took all the grind and the stress in order for me to blossom as a leader. I, if I weren't pushed, I would have never I would have been too afraid. But at that point, I was you know, we were probably within a couple months of the end of runway. And I thought I have to be me. And I went through several different versions of that, where I just got pushed and pushed and pushed more and more to be me. And every time that I was me, I raised money or made that key higher or got to the next level of revenue every single time. So it was kind of like the universe was like, go be you for God's sake, stop fighting yourself. I think a lot of founders can relate to the ups and downs of fundraising, uh, sort of self-doubt, especially when dealing with rejections. And I'm curious what kept you motivated and persistent during like some of those tough times. I'm definitely a growth junkie through pain, through suffering and outside of suffering. But I, I do think that I, I was very motivated first by the culture. Once I built a culture that I loved, this love culture, which was very polarizing, right? Some people, we, we got emails from people that were like, I would be the janitor at your company. This is the kind of culture I've been looking for my entire career. And then we had some people react to it when we pitched them and say, I would never join your company. I don't want to hug my coworkers at work. Like it was extremely polarizing, but it was the culture that I loved, you know, and I was the one that was there the entire time through the 10 years that I built it. So I think once I built that culture, I loved, I felt really like protective over it. And I wanted to champion it. I wanted it to win, not just for the service. You know, I was excited about the service too, but it almost became a higher level calling and mission to say, could we have a culture that in some ways was very emotional, like we cared about the human, we would check in on how people emotionally were doing at work without being their therapists. But we, we were open to those conversations and we were very vulnerable. And I was like, this is an experiment that needs to win, that needs to get out there. And so I think when times got tough, I would remind myself of that. And I think to the core of it though, I just wanted to, I've always been somebody that's willing to have a dark night of the soul, you know, and I find that there's great growth that comes out of it as horrible as they are, which is probably why I became a trauma informed coach. And also, you know, I help people working with psychedelics as well. Like there's kind of this, this, the shadow element that I find very intriguing and has always helped me grow and everybody around me grow. Yeah, on that, I'm, I'm very curious. You mentioned after selling the company, you had some transformative experiences. I'm yeah. curious if you could kind of dive deeper into how the psychedelic integration and somatic therapy played a role in a role in your recovery. Basically, six months after I sold the company, I took a sabbatical. I started meditating. And in my meditation class, 
20 minutes into my meditations, I would hit a wall and it was a physical wall. It was located in my stomach and it was a mixture of and anger and rage and I wanted to scream and my skin would crawl. It was unlike any experience I'd ever had. I, I was a very cerebral person. I had emotions, but I wasn't very physical. I was more cerebral. I went to my meditation teacher and he said, this feels like it could be physical trauma. Have you heard of somatics? I said, no, what is, what is somatic therapy? And so I stumbled into this world of uh, basically, if you've ever read The Body Keeps the Score um, or another great book, Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine, who I recommend to anybody embarking on this, it is the idea that we can hold a lot of our emotional trauma and stress in our body. That there is mapping in our body that if we don't actually release the pressure and release the fight or flight energy, then it will get stuck in us. After I had that experience, I was also at the same time studying psychedelic integration. And I realized that I had a lot more to process than I thought about the sale of my company because I felt a lot of shame about it. I sold in basically right when COVID started. So my entire team who was going to get acquired by the acquirer, they were going to work for the acquirer. At the last minute, they all got cut. They all ended up going jobless into a COVID market. And I just felt so ashamed. I felt so horrible for them. I did everything I could on the ground to get them new jobs. But still, that shame just lingered in my stomach. It was only about a year and a half later that I went on a retreat. It was a psychedelic retreat, and we, and it was an international retreat. We ended up, we ended up doing this medicine. It's called San Pedro, and it's a cactus medicine. I ended up sitting with that medicine for days after the journey. For some context, San Pedro, so ayahuasca is considered the grandmother medicine. She's sassy. She kind of tells you as it is. She'll slap you around, but she'll show you the truth. San Pedro's grandfather medicine. He's much gentler. And so San Pedro would sit, came over and sat with me. It was, I was, it was nighttime. I couldn't sleep. And he came and he sat with me and we'd have these conversations. Okay. And the conversation he had, he actually showed me, I was thinking about the company and it showed me that I was on a train station platform. Here I was grieving the company, grieving the company, feeling guilty. And I looked around and everybody had left the station except for me. All my employees had moved on. All of my customers had moved on. The restaurants had found their, their homes, their businesses, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm the only one at the station. And I go, well, how, okay, this is ridiculous. I got to move on. I got to leave the station. But I, did, I couldn't see any trains coming. And so I looked over and um, instead I felt this calling to build a shrine. And so I went to the middle of the platform and in my mind, I built a shrine and I put flowers. I put photos of my team and every office we were in, us building the office together, us having our team dinners together, laughing together, working hard together, fundraising announcements. I laid incense. And basically what it told me was what you need to do instead of trying to, instead of sitting in the grief, but also just trying to move beyond it is to honor it because it was the experience that is laying the foundation for what you'll do next. And you can come back to the shrine as often as you'd like, and you can honor it as much as you want. And somehow in honoring the experience that I had and in honoring the grief and the shame, I was able to finally let it go and move through it and start my next, you know, my next path. That's awesome. I guess, um, so San Pedro is a, like a, is it a, like a mushroom? I don't, I, I don't it's know. It's a cactus. It's cactus. It's a cactus. Okay. It's a cactus. Yeah. Yeah. I a mean, I, I, I hear a lot of like founders and, and people like trying this stuff out and they're kind of getting really good insights on like where they should take the direction of their life. I would say one unique thing that you have done, which I haven't seen from a lot of founders is, or coaches, executive coaches is, Usually executive coaches, that's almost like their career. They just go mm. as a coach into being a coach. I mean, maybe they're a psychologist at first or, or something else. You've kind of come from the battle of like being a founder and all that like <clears throat> trauma and stress. So it does give you like a really unique perspective, probably that founders are not going to get from other executive coaches, right? That are out there, like that level of stress mm. that you probably felt another coach hears it and processes it and gives an answer and like tries to solve for it. But because you've been through all of those wars, you probably give really unique 
insights and nuance, and it's so nuanced that like maybe an executive coach, I don't know, they may not understand. You know, one thing I've, I've realized, one value of coaching is to be somebody's witness. I didn't realize that was important. You know, I thought in the beginning, I was like, it's got to be tactical or strategic, it's advice. And then I realized for a lot of my founders, they want to be witnessed by somebody who actually understands. And so I think that there is, I, I can play that part. And sometimes, I mean, my heart bleeds in sessions for these founders because I was there. I mean, I cry in sessions with my founders sometimes because I'm just like, oh, I feel that heartbreak when your co-founder does some, leaves you, right? My co-founder left after six years and it broke my heart, broke it open, but it broke my fucking heart. So I think I can sit with them in that. And then sometimes too, I can surface really unique insights. Like I was just working with somebody last week. He was talking about how his, one of his employees is getting really defensive about their customer success process. And he's leaning in and he's asking a bunch of tough questions. As he was telling me the story, I just had this like little hit and I was like, I don't know if this is it, but can I offer you some advice? Cause usually a coach can't give advice, but I, I usually I'm like, can I give advice? And they're like, yes. So I give the advice. I'm like, I had this advice given to, I had this given to me, this feedback. I used to ask a lot of questions of people, my team, but what was, what I was doing was I was hiding my opinion behind questions. The team used to get frustrated because they were like, just tell me what you're thinking and then we can address that instead of asking these open-ended questions when you actually have an opinion or you, you have a criticism. Just give me the criticism. And when I said that, he was like, oh my God, that's, that resonates with me so much. So there are pieces like that where I can kind of dig into my experience and be like, I don't know, I did that before and here's what I got. Let's see if that fits for you, if that doesn't fit for you. Most coaches don't give advice they usually are listeners that actually kind of frustrates me in a sense like because so at some point you want that advice so i guess you're towing the line of building that trust as a coach not like cramming incorrect because you you know you might not be right also you're you know some some of the some of the time totally. so it's like listening is you can't go wrong listening so i guess that's the reason maybe one strategy in like trying to help a, a co-founder I guess one question, and as you were talking about this, you mentioned it takes a lot to go as long as you've gone building that company. It sounds like it was one of the dark, most dark times when your co-founder left six years in. Like, mm. you know, when co-founders leave a company, that you know, it, 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 it's a, ma like a major blow and a lot of companies just fall apart. It sounded like you were still determined enough to get this to like an exit and to a place like you know, where, where it's successful to, to, to some kind of exit, but like losing a co-founder, you probably relied on them quite a bit. Like, was it a dynamic between you and them? Was it the stress of the company? Was it like the lack of something that like you guys needed, like out of, outside of building a startup? Like how would you, is there a way to keep that co-founder? I guess I'm asking this question for other Ooh. founders out there. Yeah. That like going back, you spoke about Gary Tan, he, him and his co-founder, they broke apart. They had a company called Posturus. I don't know if you know oh. that story. They had tension. Something went wrong. Mm. They disagreed on like the direction of the company. And then Posturus, which was a really like, it was kind of like an online blogging site mm. really early on. It, it basically fell apart because they were not like agreeing and not happy working together. And I'm like, he talks about that openly a lot. And I really appreciate that because you don't see a lot of founders talk about it. They kind of bottle it up like, why did their company implode? It's like a shame, you know, they're shameful about like that sort of thing. But what could co-founders do to keep that going that long? Like, how do you, even six years is a long time to go with yeah. a co-founder. So like, you know, a lot of the fighting happens in the first year, right? Second year, <laughs> like first year, second year, it's like really intense and people mm -hmm. are just like opinionated. But anyway, mm -hmm. I've been just been talking, but maybe you can unpack that for other founders who listen to, the, to this. You know, I love my co-founder. Like I, it was his birthday last week. I wished him happy birthday, you know? So it, so we've come out of this. Uh, here's what I'll say. One is sometimes your co-founder needs to leave. Sometimes that is what's best for them and the company. So I don't want to give advice to keep the co-founder necessarily, right? It was one of the biggest pieces of growth for me. I mean, it was heavy. So Jeff, my co-founder, he actually, you know, when I look back, he did tell me, he did signal to me that, hey, I don't know if I'm going to make it past the Series A or the Series B. And he had been an engineer before. He hadn't been, you know, a C-level or a manager before. And he loved building. And we worked really well together. And he had, he had dropped those hints. I don't know if I'll make it past. We'll see. We'll see. 
And of course, me as the CEO and as the founder, I was like blazing through that. I barely heard him. I did not listen. And I, my orientation was keep him. Keep him for as long as we can. When really I could have leaned into, okay, why do you say that? Let's talk about it. And maybe, hell, I think if I look back, I could have been like, why don't we just plan for you to be here until the A or the B? And let's figure out what your tour of duty is. What is it that you want to, when you leave this company, that you can look back and you can say, these are the, exp these are the skill sets I've learned, and this is what I, was, what I was able to feel and to grow it to. Let's set your tour of duty and let's set your outcome. And then when you hit that outcome, let's plan for it because you don't have to be here forever. But I think that as, an, as a first time founder and at the early stages, we cling. We cling to what's familiar and what's known. I certainly did. I couldn't stand the thought of losing him. And so when the time came around and he was like, I, it's time for me to go, I was distraught. I hadn't listened. We hadn't planned. And we hadn't planned for this. Uh, what I will say is my biggest fear was that when he left, that I wouldn't be able to run this company on my own. I learned a few things. One is I didn't have to run it on my own. I had an amazing executive team and management team. I had an amaz amazing team in general. So th there's this fallacy that we have as founders of the, we have to go through it alone. And yes, as the CEO or as one of the founders, you do have a unique burden on some things you do go through alone. Fundraising, I had to go through mostly alone. I had advisors that supported me. So there are things you go through alone, but that doesn't mean you, could, you have to do it without support. And so the second thing I learned is I absolutely could leave this company as a solo founder. I had a limiting belief around the fact that I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't tough enough. I wasn't inspirational enough. I didn't have enough heart. He, I had the story, he was the heart of the culture and I wasn't. These things were not true. They weren't true. What happens is we evolved. And this is so, this is so easy to say in, you know, in hindsight, but it's not so much about fearing the unknown, but seeing it as an opportunity for evolution. What happened when my co-founder left was that I ended up eventually, eventually promoting our VP of Ops to COO. Him coming in really evolved the company to where it needed to go culturally. So we went from a love company. And this love company was wonderful for the first six years, six and a half years. But what started to happen, and I saw it in myself, it became a toxic mother culture. We started to coddle people. We were a little too family. By this time, we had scaled to maybe 80, 100 people full time, maybe a couple hundred people part time. And so we needed to professionalize more. And when my CEO, I promoted my COO, what happened was we evolved from love to love and excellence. And that came with new blood, new personality, new management style. I learned to hold people to a higher standard. My COO learned to have more heart and empathy for the human behind the company. And we were able to grow an amazing dual pillared culture that wouldn't have happened if it was just me and my co-founder in our old dynamic. So it was a huge blessing for the company, even though it was extremely painful for me. That's really good advice for everyone, for everyone listening. So I guess like as a second time founder, you would hear your co-founder more on yeah. like suggestions about like what they're saying to you. I would listen and then I would build, I would build a plan. So I call this the tour of duty. I think Reed Hoffman talks about this yeah. where you just set it up with them. Okay. If you think you, you're not going to like the post growth stage, then let's plan for it. Let's, you don't even have to set the number of years. I, I would say set up, do a detailed bullet points about what are the experiences that you'd wanna leave with to feel fulfillment in the role that you had in the company. And that could be your signpost. And then maybe every few months you check in on that in your one-on-ones. How are we feeling? Are we tracking to what you wanna be doing? Oh, are you realizing this isn't actually an experience you care about, but this one you care about? In that way, we probably would have Ironically, in planning for his exit, we would have had more longevity for him, I believe, because we would have for him. Ultimately, the reason he left, he didn't love the management piece of it at that time. He loved building and God bless him. Of course, I, uh, management is an entirely different track and skill set, you know, but I, I still clung to him because I was like, we need you as a manager. And I think if we could have planned for him to be a really strong co-founder, I see and not had that be a weird shameful thing or a thing that the board frowned upon, but we said, this is how the path is gonna go. It would have been received way better and he would have lasted longer. Why is that a shameful thing? Like, why does a founder have to grow out of an IC? It's like a cultural thing, I think out yeah. there where 
if you're a co-founder of this company, you must grow with the company and not express your opinion and you must do everything possible. I think an example of that is like the Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak thing, right? Where Steve Jobs kind of like took the company to the next level. Steve Wozniak kind of left, but he was, Uh as far as I know, he was an IC in that company. Uh But it'd be interesting if like there was more culture out there of like just supporting what the founder wants like long-term. I guess in some way you were trying to shepherd him for his growth also maybe. You're like, hey, I don't know. I mean, you know, you were there, (laughs) so. (laughs) I think there's, there's a few things here. One is there's like this, there's a scarcity mindset about resources. Literally, it's like, well, we don't have enough people to be managers. So if you're going to be a leader of this company, you have to manage. So that's one, which at the early stages I get. But once you get to 100, 200 people, you don't have to be a manager necessarily if you want to be a leader at the company. There are ways to scale yourself where you as the founder could manage one person or zero people if you so choose. So I think I think that ha- that fallacy needs to get thrown out. I think there's an ego thing, too. We think as a advancing on the corporate ladder. I've seen this, whether you're a founder or not, I see this with salespeople, engineers. They're like, oh, to get next up in my career, I need to become a manager. And I've talked people out of management positions. I'm like, you do understand that manager, the manager role is an entirely different skill set. You're not going to be on the ground building like you, you used to, right? And w- the way we fixed that or worked with that at Choose was that we actually had a completely separate IC track that you could level up in and get paid more. I think most people see a pay ceiling if they don't want to manage, which is stupid, especially if you're a strong engineer or a strong sales rep. If the best engineers are 10x more productive than the, you know, an average engineer. So you got it, but you have to give them opportunities to continue to get paid more and more, even as an IC. Otherwise, they feel like they have to go into the management track. And then your A plus engineer or sales rep becomes a B or a C plus manager that you end up having to fire. Such a shame. Yeah, so I think we, we work with that by just saying you can be an IC and you can make a ton of money, more money than a manager, even if you're really good. You've written that we are one system. Unless past wounds are healed, your personal is present in your professional. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on this belief and, and provide some insight on how it informs your, your coaching style. So when I was younger, I was bullied really badly. Uh, that that wound is something I didn't connect with as a young adult. I kind of shoved it under the rug. I was like, get over it. It was your childhood. You're going to move on. And I remember I did when I was 24, we had just right before we raised our Series A, I did the CEO boot camp with Jerry Colonna. We were, we were in a group talking about being bullied. And so I shared my experience that I was bullied so badly that during lunch, I used to eat lunch alone in the bathroom stall. Jerry comes over to me and he goes, remind me what your company does again? I said, well, we make sure that nobody eats lunch alone. That's why we do group catering. I never put that together, that my past was a deep and intimate part of my present. In that moment, I felt like I had almost a sober psychedelic experience. I felt like 30,000 volts of electricity go through my body. And I, I, I realized that actually, this, this source of, of trauma in my life could actually be the fuel for some of my greatest transformation and leadership. And so I, I realized that's of course why I care about inclusion. I was excluded and I was here to take care of every young kid that lived in every adult that was working at the office that ever felt excluded by making sure they sat together and ate together at the table. So I think it informed a huge part of the culture of us as a, a love culture and a community culture. And then my leadership style, I became very vulnerable after that in sharing that story with people, but seeing it as strength and not as weakness. I'd say as a coach, it's a really interesting question. You know, for me as a coach now, because I saw how deeply my trauma impacted me and became my strength, when I work with founders, one of my intake questions is, are you willing to talk about your personal history? Because some founders, when they see the word executive coach, they're like, all right, we're here to talk business. And I even with my clients in the beginning, clients will be like, oh, I have something personal. Is, is, is that OK? Is that too weird to share? And I'm like, oh, my God, come on, bring it. Let's do it. And so because and I think it's you're one person, you're one system. And I want to know if you had something like that happen in your childhood, because chances are if you had a tense relationship with your mother, you're going to start to see some of that weirdness and that dynamic show up 
in your relationship with your executives, no doubt. And we can, I can give you all the best advice, but if I don't have the context about your childhood, then I may not be giving you the best advice. And I'm not a therapist, this is where the coach and the therapist, you know, we walk a fine line. I will say that this is a point where we can acknowledge the past and say it's not gonna take the driver's seat, but we have to honor it in some way, shape or form. And I have different practices that I can help people with. You know, obviously psychedelics is one path, but there's totally sober practices as well. But you're, you're one system. And I think there's no shame in that. We just have to learn it so that your shadow doesn't overtake you, but becomes your light. You mentioned um, Jerry Colonna briefly. Um, he's like a big time coach. You know, I've heard some of his stuff in the past. And I guess you worked with him Amazing. like boot camp or something like that. Like a <laughs> executive coach boot camp. Like how did boot you boot camp? Like, it was like so it was like, you know, summer camp for CEOs. I mean, that sounds amazing. Like I think that it was amazing. Probably was really helpful and insightful. And I mean, those types of events are really great to go to just because you can share like experiences. Like what did you learn in that like experience? Like I said, I was about twenty four and I had this notion that I think a lot of early entrepreneurs have that when I make the exit, when I hit the revenue number, I will be happy then completely dismantled that belief at an early age, which was a little bit of a young life crisis. The way that it happened is we were sitting it was about 15 CEOs in a, in a semicircle from pre fundraise me on one end to exit and earn out on the other end. And um, we're looking down the line and we're talking about our experiences and it hits me that nobody's happy. Not one of us is happy, no matter how much wealth no matter how much success on paper. And I look down the line and I go, what the hell? You exited and earned out. Y you must be happy. This is why I'm doing what I do. You've got to be happy. And they would go, well, here's the problem. In my success, I neglected my kids, so they don't want to talk to me. My wife hates me and we're getting at a divorce. I stopped exercising, so I've gained a lot of weight, and that's led to this chronic illness. And I've really petered out of all my creative ideas because I didn't take care of myself. And this breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that on paper, and, and this is the hustle culture, and this is Silicon Valley culture, you know, we tout how incredible it is, and there's an overemphasis on wealth, revenue, valuation. But what we don't talk about is what happens to our personal lives, what happens to our hearts, what happens to all the other parts of us and our health. And that suffers. And I've seen the burnout culture. And I've now interviewed over 20 entrepreneurs at this point. The ab Once somebody actually burns out, like not just exhaustion, but like deep, deep misalignment, they burn out with their company. It takes them between three to five years to recover. And when they recover, they're never the same. And so these are these are things that when we're going in, they're like, I, I have people tell me, well, how come how come we were never told? And I said, well, you know, people don't share this because it, it comes off as weak. You only share the headline customer that you just signed up or the big investor that you just closed your round with. I did the same thing. I'm not saying I'm above it. I made every mistake like that in the book. And I feel like karmically, I got to go back and write those wrongs and expose the underbelly so people can see the toxicity of this kind of burnout and hustle culture. And now my work is to train them on an alternative path. Because I'm not saying you don't work hard. I think you do have to work hard, but you can also work a lot smarter and take into account your biology and your psychology, which includes your traumas, your triggers, your natural energy rhythms, you know, your diet and your exercise. All of these things are important, but they get neglected. And that actually gets put on a pedestal in the early stages. It's, I, I find it deeply troubling. One of the common issues you, you address is uh, poor boundaries, like time, energy, emotions. And I'm wondering, why do you think so many leaders struggle with setting and maintaining boundaries? I don't think it's the same answer for every entrepreneur, but what, the things that I've seen in my practice and amongst my friends and myself, there's a shadow and a light side. The shadow side is the people pleaser. The light side is the servant oriented leader. A lot of people, we care deeply about our customers, our investors, and our team, which means that we become the martyr, right? We become the martyr and, and it, that becomes toxic. And so I, I think that's a huge one. So the martyr and the people pleaser are very intertwined, poor boundaries. Plus, you know, internally they want to please people. That could be based on their trauma too. It's a lot of them. And I, I say this to a lot of my founders, you have to be just traumatized enough to start a company. Not, not too traumatized, because then you don't have the resilience to handle it. That's my one of my dogs, Cosmo. You might see the other one running around. 
So you have to be just traumatized enough. There's usually some sort of trauma, some sort of chip on your shoulder that has you wanting to go into the arena and prove yourself. You know, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that is something that we have to be very aware of. And oftentimes it's because entrepreneurs, when they were young, had to take on a role of caretaking. Oftentimes they were parentified. So maybe they had a sick parent, maybe they had an absent parent, they had a single mother or a single father, and they felt like they had to step up into a role as, as an older person. They've been, they've been old for a long time. They've always put themselves first, uh, sorry, second, and they've always put others first. This is a very in, unconscious behavior that we have to do work to kind of unravel because you start to realize that as a leader, yes, there is something humble and you do want to be a servant leader. But at the point that you're breaking your back for everybody, you can't lead. I, so that is one strong theme that I see for people and why they have such poor boundaries with it. But then the second thing is Silicon Valley. I had an investor when I was uh, when I first raised my seed round, we sat down together in SF and I told him, I was like, man, you know, I'm not dating. I'm not I'm not seeing my friends. And I, even then I had a sense something was off. I was like, I'm a little worried that I'm a little too obsessive. He immediately says, don't worry, Tracy. My best founders in my portfolio are absolutely obsessed and have no life. And he was like, you're doing great. Really, for years, I could not get that voice out of my head. It's still in my head. It's part of my programming as a young entrepreneur. So we take the caretaker plus reinforce with Silicon Valley narrative. And it's a that's your recipe for disaster. And so you really see it as almost trying to please others. So in that case, please, please that investor and not respect your own needs. Do you think a lot of people just haven't identified what their kind of boundaries are? They're just, they haven't done that introspection or they're just afraid to sort of say it or they're just simply prioritizing others over themselves? You know, there is an excitement, right? I mean, there's a huge excitement when you're starting a company and that rush becomes addictive in its own right. That rush is something that we tap into again and again to overcome the long nights, working the weekends, having to say no yet again to a friend's wedding because you have to fundraise. So I think the excitement can pull people away from thinking about their own needs because it's, it's heady. I mean, it's one of the biggest rushes ever, to be honest. There's nothing quite like it. So, so they're not prepared so oftentimes that you, you have these rose colored glass, you're like, this is going to be awesome. And it's going to be awesome forever. How could this feeling ever end? And then like a lobster being boiled, you, it slowly starts to dawn on you. You slowly start to see friendships leave. You start to gain weight. You start having sleep issues. You start noticing that you have periods of depression. You start noticing your weekends. All you're doing all day is watching Netflix, right? Like you can't, but somehow during the week you muster the energy, but you crash on the weeknights and the weekends, right? These little things start to boil you alive. You're really deep in it. And by that point, you don't have enough resilience and resourcing to think about what are my boundaries. It's best to do a boundaries exercise when you're in a healthy spot. Otherwise, you, you're not seeing very clearly because you're just in survival mode. You mentioned if you started a company again, you would do things differently. I'm curious if um, you see, for example, raising investor funding as sort of a source of this um, boundary misalignment and uh, and burnout, if, if that would be yeah. something that you would choose not to do again, or how, how would you approach it? I wouldn't say categorically yes or no. It depends. I would be much more honest about the opportunity, though. First off, I would, you know, for right now, I'm building a coaching brand, you know, a personal brand around training founders and leaders on how to honor their biology and psychology as they're growing companies. This doesn't require outside funding. Now, it might get to a point where I wanna host retreats. Even then, probably doesn't require outside funding. But let's say I wanna, I wanna actually start an app where you know it's a meditation app combined with accountability tracker. At that point, maybe I'll raise funding. So I, I think I wanna, I wanna be really clear that it's not that the funding itself is the source of burnout, but you, you have to realize that once you start the fundraise process, you are signing up for a ride where you want to take a company big, especially after angel funding. You know, we raised $40 million. And so once you get to VC levels, there are expectations on returns, and rightly so. VCs aren't wrong for expecting that. But when you play that game, you got to be all in. And when I was running Choose, I wanted to be a public company CEO. I mean, that was a huge source of my motivation, and I was ready to gun for it until the very end, until we couldn't raise our Series C, 
And that was the point when the market was too skittish about delivery startups because a few had failed right before we went to raise the seed. And I said, okay, this was going to be a big go big or go home bet. So we're going home. We're going to find this place, you know, this company a home. Um, but you have to be hyper committed to it. And I think a lot of founders don't understand what that takes. And I just want them to go into it with eyes wide open because I think it's okay to go on that ride, but you just have to know it. And then when you go on it, I still think there are ways to work smarter. For instance, one of the things that my founders are the most resistant to, this is the one piece of advice I give over and over that takes me months to convince my founders. This is where I'm a terrible coach, by the way, because I have, sometimes I have very strong opinions and I tell them, I'm like, look, I'm your coach, but here's my strong opinion. And if you don't like it, I'll back off of it. And I'm going to bring it back to you in a few months when you're ready. And if you're not ready, then I'll keep bugging you. The big thing I tell my founders is hire your operational executive early, hire your right hand and delegate a lot to them. And if you don't like managing, then delegate a lot of the management to them. And I think founders get really skittish. They're like, do I really need a COO or chief of staff or VP of ops? Like I should be able to do it all on my, you know, all alone. And, and that's one of the biggest fallacies I see. So I think if you're going to go into a hyperscale drive, you need your operational leader. And I would hire for that person way earlier than I did. What exactly is a chief of staff? A lot of founders don't know. You're going like beyond like a lot of the, like at one, what point did you go, I need a chief of staff? Like what's that, you know, and what is a chief of staff? Yeah. Okay. Well, funny you asked that because honestly, I didn't hire a chief of staff. I, I went from EA to COO. I see a chief of staff somewhere in between the EA and the COO. So they're much higher level than the EA. Uh, usually they don't manage people. They just report directly to the CEO and they're kind of your leader of special projects. Like you can hand them a problem and they turn it into a project and then they can get organizational buy-in to scooch it forward. And then you're kind of quietly behind the scenes, making sure that they push those, that they have the buy-in to push, push those projects forward. I went pretty much straight to the COO so he could help me manage pretty much half of the team. And um, and he was really much more of a partner. I think the chief of staff is a little less on the equal level of the partnership and more of a, an IC that reports to you. You see some of these um, founders go years and years and years, like, like I'll give you Warren Buffett, the guy's still working. Why do some founders burn out and why do some like Ooh. go so long like Jeff Bezos? Like, I don't understand it's maybe just bound there. There's probably so many factors like that go into this, but how can someone go that long? Like a Jeff, Jeff Bezos ran the company for a long time, like running that company under huge amounts of stress. And I'm like, he, at some point he's, you know, he's slowly like releasing the reins off, off of the company, but like, I guess there's a, an innate drive or something. Like, have you analyzed this at all and, and thought about this? How, do you work with founders that have like been running their companies for like long stints like that? So I have spoken to founders and that have burned out. I have spoken to founders who have lasted. One, the theme behind burnout that, I've, that I'm starting to see as a very consistent pattern is not what you would expect. It is not about workload. It is not like, oh, I worked too many hours and so I burned out. That's kind of what I went into my, I wanted to kind of, I'm in the middle of really this research project around burnout. So I'm like, what the hell is this? This is number of hours and I'm learning as I go deeper and deeper, it is way more than number of hours. That's exhaustion. What I see is burnout, something along the way got misaligned for the founder. It, it's actually a deep misalignment. And usually they, they approach the cliff of burnout because they weren't able to be honest with themselves about the misalignment and take action. So I will say when I ended up selling the company, I didn't leave burnt out because I was, I had a few really honest heart to hearts with myself where one of them, I literally sat on a couch, turned off all my electronics and said, what, what do I want to build? Like, what do I want to do here? And I ended up having a two hour conversation with myself, which resulted in me selling the company. But a lot of founders, that's very scary. So they, so they fall off the cliff when they have misalignment. There is a, there are six categories here that have been well studied this researcher named Maslach. These categories, I've been, I've been sort of implementing this as a burnout survey with my founders. So one of the top ones that I see misalignment with is control. When you feel that you have lost control, and that may not be because you were ousted from your seat. Maybe you didn't have the resources because you, you couldn't get enough money in the bank, right? And you constantly feel like you don't have control over your destiny because you don't have enough resources to do it, or, Maybe you have a co-founder or a very advocate board member 
who is siphoning off your control and you don't feel that you you have the control you want because somebody's over your shoulder. Um, reward. This is when founders don't pay themselves enough or they don't feel they're being rewarded extrinsically in terms of praise or intrinsically because of pride in their work. Sometimes it's fairness. You know, they see some other people being treated better than they are. Uh, maybe their co-founder is being treated better than them. Maybe the equity split at some point in the beginning, you know, they said it was fine, but it actually wasn't and it breaks them. So it is usually, or it could be mission. You know, this happens a lot to founders where they start off and they have a strong idea of where the company's going. Three pivots later, you know, they start off thinking that they're gonna be solving, curing cancer. Three pivots later, you know, they're selling shoes to goats. And you're like, well, this isn't, and, and they raise $20 million for that, right? Yeah, you, you got all the resources in the world, but you actually were starting this because you wanted to save people's lives, right? That's an obviously extreme example, but you know, you, you have to feel it, and, but they feel a strong sense of obligation because they raised the money and they pitched it. So again, it's not having the honesty, and this is where burnout culture and, and this kind of hustle culture is so toxic. Because you work so many hours, you don't get the opportunity to step back and go, what, the, what did I build? <laughs> Am I even enjoying myself? Because if you're not, you don't always have to be happy every day that you're doing this, but if you're not feeling an innate sense of satisfaction or fulfillment with the right amount of challenge, then something might be off. But it's very scary to look at what's off. Founders are very afraid to look at this because we fear the worst, which means I have to sell the company and then I'm gonna lose my identity and then my founder, my investors are gonna hate me. So that heart to heart is a very scary conversation. Awesome. I know we're coming up on the top of the hour, so I appreciate all of this, hey. this time with you. Um, any parting questions, Greg, on any, anything that you'd like? Uh... What advice would you give to current and aspiring founders, especially those that might be feeling isolated or overwhelmed by challenges? Mm. Sometimes isolation from others is actually a sign that you're isolating from yourself. And that could look like, in my case, when I first started my Series A fundraise, I dressed like a guy because I thought that's what I had to do to raise money. And my male mentor dressed in these Converse sneakers. And so I have these photos, this photo of these Converse sneakers I wore my first day and my t-shirt, my jeans. I never wore that, by the way, you know, like that wasn't my style. And I just felt so disconnected from myself. And because of that, I felt really disconnected from my pitch. And so my first 32 pitches, I got rejected and I was kind of lifeless. 33rd pitch, we were six weeks away from running out of money. And I thought, what have I been doing? I've got to be me. So I walked in, I dressed like the way that I dress. I dressed a nice blouse, I wore some makeup. And I told the investors that I wanted to build a company based on a love culture. And they invested that day. And it was just, so I, I think, and I felt really isolated. And it's, it was easy, it would have been easy to blame others, blame, be a victim, you know, blame the culture. I think too often we blame the culture, but I think ultimately you have to bring your culture, you have to bring yourself into it. And people don't always like to hear this. It's much easier to complain, but I think you have to rise to the, I say this to people who are dating too. And they're like, oh, dating culture is so, so crappy. People are ghosting me and it's like, okay, that's their culture, but you have to bring your culture, show up, you know, be honest, be authentic. And I think the same is for leadership. And if, if it were easy, everybody would be leading and running companies. This is the grindstone to show up as yourself every day, even when you get rejected. And maybe it's the reason you're being rejected because you're not actually being yourself. So I try to really push that on people that feel that sense of isolation, but just look inwards, make sure you're connected to yourself first. And then you can go and do the external repair that you might need to do in terms of social relationships, partnership, maybe your team, you know, needs to see who you actually are. But yeah, it kind of starts with your relationship with yourself. That's what I found. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing your, your wisdom with us today. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me on. This is so fun. Awesome. Well, we're going to edit and publish it and then I'll send you the link to it. So uh, this was awesome. amazing, Tracy, for for catching up and, and talking. Uh, exciting to see where your journey takes you, honestly, so. Dude, I, I, I was almost gonna say like, I don't, I don't even love the word coach because it's like a part of what I do, but it's not everything. And I feel, I feel this calling to like have more impact and who knows what that looks like. Maybe it's a company, maybe it's, it's content, maybe it's retreats. I guess I'm learning to be okay with that. Like I miss the title of like, I'm a founder. Cause it's like a nice, it's like a nice box, you know, but 
now I, I live in the weird gray. I'm like, okay, I got to accept this more and more. It's going to be fun to see where you take things. So I'm sure you're going to do something creative that's like super, super different and exciting. So don't forget about us back in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> we need more people uh, bringing good energy to the. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, yeah, well, uh, We'll see. You, you're catching me in a wandering phase, but anytime I feel lost, I kind of reorient towards like, how do I be of service? And that usually keeps me keeps me feeling good. Awesome. All right, Tracy, yeah. we'll, we'll let you go. Thank you again for, okay. for being on and then we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate the time and the invite so much. Awesome. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.